Part 3. Freedom. Chapter 11. Immigration Day. Immigration Day, October 28, 1949, was the most optimistic and promising day of my life. After living in the crowded room at the Rothschild Hospital for a month, and spending another five months in a tiny apartment in Vienna, waiting for our visas, we were on the threshold of our new home. A sunny blue sky lit the Atlantic as we stood on the deck of the USAT General R. L. House. Lady Liberty came into view, tiny in the distance like the little figurine in a music box. Then New York City became visible, a skyline emerging, intricate, where only horizon had been for weeks. I held Marianne up against the deck rail. We're in America, I told her. The land of the free. And I thought we finally were free. We had taken the risk. Now safety and opportunity were our rewards. It seemed a just and simple equation. Thousands of miles of ocean separated us from barbed wire, police searches, camps for the condemned, camps for the displaced. I did not yet know that nightmares know no geography, that guilt and anxiety wander borderless. For twenty minutes on the upper deck of a passenger ship, standing in the October sun, my daughter in my arms, New York in sight, I believed the past couldn't touch me here. Magda was already there. In July she had finally received her visa and sailed to New York, where she now lived with Aunt Matilda and her husband in the Bronx. She worked in a toy factory, putting the heads on little giraffes. It takes an elephant to make a giraffe, she had joked in a letter. In another hour, maybe two, I would embrace my sister, my brave sister, her jokes at the ready to transcend pain. As Marianne and I counted the whitecaps between the ship and solid land, as I counted my blessings, Bela came up from the tiny cabin where he was packing the last of our things. My heart swelled again with tenderness for my husband. In the weeks of travel, in the little cot in the room that rocked and bobbed across black water, through black air, I felt more passion for him than ever before in our three years together, more than on the train on our honeymoon when we conceived Marianne. Back in May, in Vienna, he had been unable to decide, unable to choose, up until the last minute. He stood behind a pillar at the train station where he was to meet Bundy and Marta, suitcase in hand. He saw our friends arrive, saw them searching the platform for us. He continued to hide. He saw the train pull in, heard the announcement that passengers should board. He saw people getting onto the train. He saw Bundy and Marta at the door of a train car, waiting for him. Then he heard the clerk on the loudspeaker calling his name. He wanted to join our friends, he wanted to board the train and meet the ship and rescue the boxcar holding his fortune. But he was frozen there behind the pillar. The rest of the passengers filed on board, Bundy and Marta too. When the train doors closed, he finally forced himself into action. Against his better judgment, against all the bets he had made for what he hoped would be a safe and financially secure future, he took the biggest risk of his life. He walked away. Now, minutes away from our new life in America, nothing seemed deeper or more profound than that we had made the same choice, to relinquish security in favor of opportunity for our daughter, to start over together from scratch. To have his commitment to our daughter, to this new venture, to me, touched me deeply. And yet. This, and yet, closing like a latch. I had been ready to forsake our marriage in order to take Marianne to America. However painfully, I had been willing to sacrifice our family, our partnership, the very things Bela had been unable to accept losing. And so we began our new life on an unequal footing. I could feel that though his devotion to us could be measured in all that he had given up, he was still dizzy from what he had lost. And where I felt relief and joy, he felt hurt. 
Happy as I was to greet our new life, I could already feel that Bela's loss put a dangerous pressure on all the unknowns ahead. So there was sacrifice at the heart of our choice. And there was also a lie, the report from the medical examiner, the x-rays we had pressed inside a folder with our visa applications. We couldn't allow the ghost of Bela's old illness, his TB, to deter our future, so Chi-Chi had posed as Bela and gone with me to the medical examiner. We now carried pictures of Chi-Chi's chest, clear as spring water. When the naturalization officers cleared Bela for immigration, it would be Chi-Chi's body in medical history they legitimized, another man's body they determined to be sound. I wanted to breathe easily. To cherish our safety and good fortune as miracles, not guard them close and warily. I wanted to teach my daughter confidence in where she stood. There she was, hair whipping around her head, cheeks red from the wind. Liberty, she called, pleased with her new word. On a whim I took the pacifier that hung on a ribbon around her neck and threw it into the sea. If I had turned around, I might have seen Bela caution me. But I wasn't looking. We're Americans now. American children don't use pacifiers, I said, heady and improvising, tossing my daughter's one token of security like it was parade confetti. I wanted Marianne to be what I wanted to be, someone who fits in, who isn't plagued by the idea of being different, of being flawed, of playing catch-up forever in a relentless race away from the claws of the past. She didn't complain. She was excited by the novelty of our adventure, amused by my strange act, accepting my logic. In America we do as the Americans do, as if I knew a single thing about what Americans do. I wanted to trust my choice, our new life, so I denied any trace of sadness, any trace of fear. When I walked down the wooden ramp to our new homeland, I was already wearing a mask. I had escaped. But I wasn't yet free. Chapter 12 Greener November 1949 I board a city bus in Baltimore. Gray dawn. Wet streets. I am going to work, to the clothing factory, where I will spend all day cutting loose threads off the seams of little boys' boxer shorts, paid seven per dozen. The factory reminds me of the thread factory in Germany where Magda and I worked after we were taken from Auschwitz, dry, dusty air, cold concrete, machines clattering so loudly that when the forewoman speaks she must shout. Minimize bathroom breaks, she yells. But I hear the forewoman of the past, the one who told us we would be worked until we were all used up, and then killed. I work without stopping. To maximize my productivity, to maximize my meager pay. But also because to work without a break is an old necessity, a habit impossible to overthrow. And if I can keep the noise and the urgency around me at all times, I will not have to be alone for even a moment with my own thoughts. I work so hard that my hands shake and shake in the dark when I get home. Because Aunt Matilda and her husband didn't have the space or resources to take in my family, Magda was already an extra mouth to feed, we have begun our new life not in the Bronx, as I had imagined, but in Baltimore, where we live with Bela's brother George and his wife and two young daughters in a cramped walk-up apartment. George had been a well-known lawyer in Czechoslovakia, but in Chicago, where he first lived when he immigrated to America in the 1930s, he made a living as a fuller brush man, selling brushes and cleaning products door to door. Now, in Baltimore, he sells insurance. Everything in George's life is bitter, fear-based, discouraged. He follows me through the rooms of the apartment, watching my every move, barking at me to close the coffee can more tightly. He is angry about the past, about having been attacked in Bratislava and mugged in Chicago in his early immigrant days. And he's angry about the present, he can't forgive us for having arrived penniless, 
for having turned our backs on the eager fortune. I feel so self-conscious in his presence that I can't walk down the stairs without tripping. One day as I board the bus to work, my head is so full of my own discomfort, girding up for the rattling pace of the factory, stewing over George's unpleasantness, obsessing over our relentless worries about money, that it takes me several moments to notice that the bus hasn't started to move, that we are still at the curb, that the other passengers are staring at me, scowling, shaking their heads. I begin to prickle with sweat. It is the feeling I had when I woke to hear armed Nihilas banging on our door at dawn. The fear when the German soldier held a gun to my chest after I picked the carrots. The feeling that I have done wrong, that I will be punished, that the stakes are life and death. I am so consumed by the sensation of danger and threat that I can't put together what has happened, that I have boarded the bus the European way taking my seat and waiting for the conductor to come and sell me a ticket. I have forgotten to put my token in the change box. Now the bus driver is yelling at me, pay or get off. Pay or get off. Even if I could speak English, I would not be able to understand him. I am overcome by fear, by images of barbed wire and raised guns, by thick smoke rising from chimneys and obscuring my present reality by the prison walls of the past closing in on me. It is the opposite of what happened to me when I danced for Joseph Mendel my first night at Auschwitz. Then, I transported myself out of the barracks and onto the stage of the Budapest Opera House. Then, my inner vision saved me. Now, my inner life makes me interpret a simple mistake, a misunderstanding, as catastrophe. Nothing in the present is really wrong, nothing that can't be easily fixed. A man is angry and frustrated because he has misunderstood me, because I can't understand him. There is shouting and conflict. But my life is not in danger. And yet, that is how I read the present situation. Danger, danger, death. Pay or get off. Pay or get off the driver shouts. He stands up from his seat. He is coming toward me. I fall to the ground, I cover my face. He is above me now, grabbing my arm, trying to yank me to my feet. I huddle on the floor of the bus, crying, shaking. A fellow passenger takes pity on me. She is an immigrant like me. She asks me first in Yiddish, then in German, if I have money, she counts the coins in my sweaty palm, she helps me back into my seat and sits with me until I'm breathing again. The bus pulls out onto the street. Stupid greener, someone says under her breath as she walks up the aisle to her seat. When I tell Magda about the incident in a letter, I turn it into a joke, an episode of immigrant, greener, slapstick. But something changed in me that day. It will be more than twenty years before I will have the language and psychological training to understand that I was having a flashback, that the unnerving physical sensations, racing heart, sweaty palms, narrowing vision, I experienced that day, and that I will continue to experience many times in my life, even now, in my late eighties, are automatic responses to trauma. This is why I now object to pathologizing post-traumatic stress by calling it a disorder. It's not a disordered reaction to trauma, it's a common and natural one. But on that November morning in Baltimore I didn't know what was happening to me, I assumed that my collapse meant that I was deeply flawed. I wish I had known that I wasn't a damaged person, that I was suffering the fallout of an interrupted life. At Auschwitz, at Mauthausen, on the death march, I survived by drawing on my inner world. I found hope and faith in life within me, even when I was surrounded by starvation and torture and death. After my first flashback, I began to believe that my inner world was where the demons lived. That there was blight deep inside me. My inner world was no longer sustaining, it became the source of my pain 
unstoppable memories, loss, fear. I could be standing in line at the fish counter, and when the clerk called my name I would see Menjel's face transposed over his. Walking into the factory some mornings I would see my mother beside me, as plain as day, I would see her turn her back and walk away. I tried to banish my memories of the past. I thought it was a matter of survival. Only after many years did I come to understand that running away doesn't heal pain. It makes the pain worse. In America I was farther geographically than I had ever been from my former prison. But here I became more psychologically imprisoned than I was before. In running from the past, from my fear, I didn't find freedom. I made a cell of my dread and sealed the lock with silence. Mary Ann, however, was flourishing. I wanted her to feel normal, normal, normal. And she did. Despite my fear that she would discover that we were poor, that her mother was afraid all the time, that life in America wasn't what we had expected, she was a happy child. At her day care, which she was allowed to attend for free because the woman who ran it, Mrs. Bauer, was sympathetic to immigrants, she learned English quickly. She became a little assistant to Mrs. Bauer, tending to the other children when they cried or fussed. No one asked her to fill that role. She had an innate sensitivity to others' hurt, and an innate confidence in her own strength. Bela and I called her the little ambassador. Mrs. Bauer would send her home with books, to help me learn English as much as to support Marianne. I try to read Chicken Little. I can't keep the characters straight. Who is Ducky Lucky? Who is Goosey Lucy? Marianne laughs at me. She teaches me again. She pretends exasperation. I pretend that I am only playing, that I am only pretending not to understand. Even more than poverty, I feared my daughter's embarrassment. I feared that she would be ashamed of me. On the weekends, she came with me to the laundromat and helped me operate the machines, she took me to the grocery store to find Jif peanut butter and a dozen other foods I'd never heard of, with names I couldn't spell or pronounce. In 1950, the year Marianne turned three, she insisted that we eat turkey for Thanksgiving, like her classmates. How can I tell her that we can't afford one? I stop at Schreiber's on the way home the day before Thanksgiving, and I'm in luck, they've put chicken on sale for twenty-nine a pound I choose the smallest one. Look, sweetie. I call when I get home. We have a turkey. A baby turkey. I want so badly for her, for all three of us, to fit in. Alienation is my chronic condition even among our Jewish immigrant friends. The winter Marianne is five, we are invited to a Hanukkah party, where all of the children take turns singing Hanukkah songs. The hostess invites Marianne to sing. I am so proud to see my intelligent and precocious daughter, who already speaks English as if it is her first language, happy and bright-eyed and eager, confidently accepting the invitation taking her place in the center of the room. She is in kindergarten now and goes to an after-school program run by a Jewish man, who unbeknownst to me has become a Jew for Jesus. Marianne beams at the guests, then closes her eyes, begins to sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. The guests stare at her and at me. My daughter has learned the skill I most want her to have, the ability to be at home anywhere. And now it is exactly her lack of understanding of the codes that separate people that makes me want to slip under the floorboards and disappear. This embarrassment, this feeling of exile, even in my own community, didn't come from without. It came from within. It was the self-imprisoning part of me that believed I didn't deserve to have survived, that I would never be worthy enough to belong. Marianne thrived in America, but Bela and I struggled. I still suffered with my own fear, 
the nightmarish memories, the panic that brewed just below the surface. And I feared Bela's resentment. He didn't struggle to learn English as I did. He had attended a boarding school in London for a time when he was a boy, and he spoke English as fluently as he spoke Czech, Slovak, Polish, German, and numerous other languages, but his stutter grew more pronounced in America, a signal to me that he was pained by the choice I had forced upon him. His first job was in a warehouse, where he lifted heavy boxes, an exertion we knew was dangerous for someone with TB but George and his wife, Dutsy, who was a social worker and had helped us find our jobs, convinced us we were lucky to have work. The pay was terrible, the labor demanding and demeaning, but it was the immigrant reality. Immigrants weren't doctors or lawyers or mayors, no matter their training and expertise, except for my remarkable sister Clara, who secured a position as a violinist in the Sydney Symphony Orchestra soon after she and Chi Chi immigrated. Immigrants drove taxis. Immigrants did piecework in factories. Immigrants stocked grocery store shelves. I internalized the feeling of unworthiness. Bela fought against it. He became short-tempered and volatile. During our first winter in Baltimore, Dutsy comes home with a snowsuit she has bought for Marianne. It has a long zipper. Marianne wants to try it on right away. It takes ages to get the snug snowsuit on over the top of Marianne's clothes, but finally we are ready for the park. We trundle down the five flights of stairs to the street. When we reach the sidewalk, Marianne says she needs to pee. Why didn't you tell us before? Bela explodes. He has never yelled at Marianne before. Let's get out of this house, I whisper that night. You got it, princess, he snarls. I don't recognize him. His anger frightens me. No, the anger I am most afraid of is my own. We managed to save enough money to move into a little maid's room at the back of a house in Park Heights, Baltimore's largest Jewish neighborhood. Our landlady was once an immigrant herself, from Poland, but she's been in America for decades already, since long before the war. She calls us greeners and laughs at our accents. She shows us the bathroom expecting us to be amazed by indoor plumbing. I think of Marishka and the little bell in the Ager mansion that I used to ring when I wanted more bread. It is easier to feign astonishment, to fulfill our landlady's expectation of who we are, than to explain, even to myself, the gulf between then and now. Bela and Marianne and I live together in the one room. We turn off the lights when Marianne goes to bed and we sit in the dark. The silence between us isn't the intimate kind, it's taut and burdened, a rope beginning to fray under the weight of its load. We do our best to be a normal family. In 1950, we splurge and go to see a movie in the theater next door to the laundromat on Park Heights Avenue. While our clothes spin in the machine, we take Marianne to see The Red Shoes, a movie written, we are proud to learn, by Emmerich Pressburger, a Jewish-Hungarian immigrant. I remember the film so well because it moved through me in two directions. Sitting in the dark, eating popcorn with my family, I felt a contentment that had grown elusive for me, a faith that all was well, that we could have a happy post-war life. But the film itself, the characters, the story, appended me with the force of recognition. Something broke through my careful mask, and I gazed into the full face of my hunger. The movie is about a dancer, Vicky Page, who catches the attention of Boris Lermontov, the artistic director of a celebrated ballet company. She practices the high kick at the bar, she dances passionately in Swan Lake, she longs for Lermontov's attention and regard. I can't look away from the screen. I feel like I am watching my own life, the one I would have gone on to live if there hadn't been a Hitler, if there hadn't been a war. For a moment I think it is Eric in the seat next to mine, 
I forget I have a daughter. I am only 23, but it feels as though the best parts of my life are over. At one point in the movie Lermontov asks Vicky, why do you want to dance? She replies, why do you want to live? Lermontov says, I don't know exactly why, but I must. Vicky says, that's my answer too. Before Auschwitz, even at Auschwitz, I would have said the same. There was a constant inner light, a part of me that always feasted and danced, that never relinquished the longing for life. Now my guiding purpose is simply to act in such a way that my daughter never knows my pain. It's a sad movie. Vicky's dream doesn't turn out the way she thought it would. When she dances the lead role in Lermontov's new ballet, she is haunted by demons. This part of the movie is so terrifying I can barely watch. Vicky's red ballet shoes seem to take control of her, they dance her almost to death. She is dancing through her own nightmares, ghouls and barren landscapes, a dance partner made of disintegrating newspaper, but she can't stop dancing, she can't wake up. Vicky tries to give up dancing. She hides the red shoes in a drawer. She falls in love with a composer, she marries him. At the end of the film, she is invited to dance one more time in Lermontov's ballet. Her husband begs her not to go. Lermontov warns her, nobody can have two lives. She must choose. What makes a person do one thing and not another? I wonder. Vicky puts the red shoes on again. This time they dance her off the edge of a building to her death. The other dancers perform the ballet without her a spotlight trained on the empty place on the stage where Vicky should be dancing. It's not a film about trauma. In fact, I don't yet understand that I am living with trauma. But the red shoes gives me a vocabulary of images, it teaches me something about myself, the tension between my inner and outer experiences. And something about the way Vicky put on the red shoes for the last time and took flight, it didn't look like choice. It looked compulsive. Automatic. What was she so afraid of? What made her run? Was it something she couldn't live with, or something she couldn't live without? Would you have chosen dance over me? Bela asks on the bus ride home. I wonder if he is thinking of the night in Vienna when I told him I was taking Marianne to America, with or without him. He already knows I am capable of choosing someone or something else. I defuse his question with flirtation. If you had seen me dance then, you wouldn't have asked me to choose, I say. You've never seen a high kick like mine. I pretend, I pretend. Somewhere deep in my chest I suppress a scream. I didn't get to choose. The silence in me rages. Hitler and Mengel chose for me. I didn't get to choose. Bela is the first to collapse under the pressure. It happens at work. He is lifting a box and he falls to the ground. He can't breathe. At the hospital, an x-ray reveals that his TB has returned. He looks more unraveled and pale than he did the day I got him out of jail, the day we fled to Vienna. The doctors transfer him to a TB hospital, and when I take Marianne to visit him every day after work, I am rigid with the fear that she will see him coughing up blood, that she will feel the possibility of death despite our efforts to hide from her how sick he is. She is four years old, she can already read, she brings picture books from Mrs. Bowers to entertain her father, she tells the nurses when he has finished his food, when he needs more water. You know what would cheer daddy up, she says to me. A baby sister. We haven't allowed ourselves to try for another child, we are too poor, and now I am relieved that we don't have the pressure of another person's hunger weighing on Bela's recovery, on my pitiful paychecks. But it breaks my heart to see my daughter yearning for a companion. To see her loneliness. 
It makes me long for my own sisters. Magda has a better job now, in New York, using the tailoring skills she learned from our father to make coats at London Fog. She doesn't want to start over again in a new city, but I beg her to come to Baltimore. In Vienna, in 1949, that is how I briefly imagined my life might turn out, bringing Marianne up with my sister instead of my husband. Then, it was a choice, a sacrifice, to spare my daughter life in a war zone. Now, if Bela dies, or if he becomes an invalid, it will be a necessity. We live in a slightly bigger apartment now, and even with two of us working we struggle to eat. I can't imagine how I will afford to pay for it alone. Magda agrees to think about coming. Don't worry, Bela says, coughing into a handkerchief. I won't let our girl grow up without a father. I will not. He coughs and stutters so badly he can barely get out the words. Bela does recover, but he is still weak. He won't be able to resume his job at the warehouse, but he will live. The medical staff at the TB hospital, taken by Bela's charm and humor, promise that before he is discharged they will help him figure out a career path that can lift us out of poverty and give him plenty of healthy years. They administer an aptitude test that Bela thinks is silly until the results come back. He is best suited to a career as an orchestra conductor or an accountant, the test reveals. We could make a new life in the ballet, he jokes. You could dance, I'd conduct the orchestra. Do you ever wish you'd studied music when you were young? It's a dangerous game to play what if with the past. I did study music when I was young. How have I forgotten this? He studied violin, like my sister. He wrote about it in those letters when he courted me. Hearing him talk about it now is like being told he used to go by a different name. I was pretty good. My teachers told me I could have gone to conservatory, and I might have, if there wasn't the family business to run. My face gets hot. I am suddenly angry. I don't know why. I want to say something that will sting, but I don't know if it is myself I want to punish, or him. Just think, I say, if you'd kept it up, you might have met Clara first instead of me. Bela tries to read my face. I can see him trying to decide whether to tease me or reassure me. Do you really want to try to convince me that I'm not happy beyond happy to be married to you? It was a violin. It doesn't matter now. Then I understand what it is that has upset me. It is the seeming effortlessness with which my husband has put to rest an old dream. If he ever suffered anguish over giving up music, he kept it hidden from me. What was wrong with me that I was still so hungry for what wasn't? Bela shows his old boss at the warehouse the results of the aptitude test, and the boss introduces Bela to his accountant, a generous man who agrees to employ Bela as his assistant while Bela takes CPA classes and works toward his license. I am restless. I have been so consumed with money worries and Bela's illness, so wrapped up in the cramped routine of hours at the factory and counting coins to buy groceries, that the good news unmoors me. The release of worry leaves me with a gaping cavity that I don't know how to fill. Bela has new prospects, a new path, but I don't. I change jobs several times in an effort to earn more, to feel better about myself. The extra money helps and the advancements do lift me for a while. But the feeling never lasts. At an insurance company, I am promoted from my station at the Ditto Machine to bookkeeper. My supervisor has noticed how hard I work, she will train me. I feel happy in the company of the other secretaries, happy to be one of them, until my new friend advises me, don't ever sit next to the Jews at lunch. They smell. I don't belong after all. I must hide who I am. 
At the luggage company where I work next, I have a Jewish boss, and I think I will finally fit in. I feel confident, accepted. Although I am a clerk, not a receptionist, one day the phone is ringing and ringing, and seeing how taxed the secretaries are, I jump in to answer the phone. My boss storms out of his office. Who gave you permission, he yells. Are you trying to ruin my reputation? No greener will represent this company. Am I making myself clear? The problem isn't that he chews me out. The problem is that I believe his assessment of my worthlessness. In the summer of 1952, shortly after Bela's recovery and a few months before Marianne turns five, Magda does move to Baltimore. She stays with us for a few months until she can find a job. We set up a bed for her in the dining area, near the front door. Our apartment is always stuffy in the summer, even at night, and Magda cracks the door a little before she goes to bed. Careful, Bela warns. I don't know what kind of palace you were living in in the Bronx, but this isn't a safe neighborhood. If you leave that door open, someone might walk right in. Don't I wish, Magda purrs, batting her eyelashes. My sister. Her pain visible only in the humor she uses to transcend it. We host a small party to welcome her, George and Dutsy come, George shakes his head at the small expense, and some of our neighbors in the apartment building, including our landlords, who bring their friend Nat Shillman, a retired Navy engineer. Magda tells a funny story about her first week in America, when Aunt Matilda bought her a hot dog on the street. In Europe, when you buy a hot dog from a vendor like that, you always get two hot dogs, and they're covered in kraut and onions. Matilda goes to pay for my hot dog, and she comes back and there's just one puny hot dog on a flimsy little bun. I thought she was too cheap to pay full price for two, or that she was making a point about my weight. I held a grudge for months, till the day I bought my own hot dog and learned that's how it is here. All eyes are on Magda on her expressive face, waiting for the next funny thing she'll say. And she has more, she always does. Nat is clearly fascinated by her. When the guests leave and Marianne is asleep, I sit with Magda on her bed, gossiping the way we did when we were girls. She asks what I know of Nat Shillman. I know, I know, he's daddy's age, she says but I have a good feeling about him. We talk until I am half asleep on her bed. I don't want to stop. There is something I need to ask Magda, something that has to do with the cavity in me, but if I ask her about the fear, the emptiness, then I must acknowledge it, and I am so used to pretending it isn't there. Are you happy? I finally work up the courage to ask her. I want her to say that she is so that I can be too. I want her to say that she'll never be happy, not really, so that I'll know the whole isn't only in me. Ditsuka, here's some advice from your big sister. Either you're sensitive, or you're not. When you're sensitive, you hurt more. Are we going to be okay? I ask. Someday? Yes, she says. No. I don't know. One thing's true, Hitler fucked us up for sure. Bela and I are now bringing in $60 a week, enough to try for a second child. I get pregnant. My daughter is born February 10, 1954. When I awaken from the anesthesia that American doctors routinely administered to all women in labor at that time, she is in the nursery. But I demand to hold my baby, I demand to nurse her. When the nurse brings her to me, I see that she is perfect and sleepy, not as big as her sister was when she was born, her nose so tiny, her cheeks so smooth. Bela brings Marianne, now six years old, to see the baby. I got my sister. 
I got my sister. Marianne celebrates, as though I have put away money in an envelope and ordered her a sister from a catalog, as though I have the capacity to always grant her wishes. She will soon also have a cousin, because Magda, who married Nat Shillman in 1953, is pregnant and will give birth to a daughter in October. She names her Ilona, after our mother. We name our own new daughter Audrey, after Audrey Hepburn. I am still dazed from the drugs the doctors used to sedate me. Even the intensity of labor, of meeting and nursing my baby for the first time, have taken on the numb quality of my life in hiding. It is a reflex to expect the bad with the good. The first months of Audrey's life, Bela studies for his CPA test as though preparing for the ultimate test, the one crucial trial that will determine forever whether or not he will find his place, his peace with himself and our choices. He doesn't pass the test. Moreover, he is told that with his stutter, his accent, he will never get a job, no matter if he is able to earn his license. There's always going to be a block in the road, he says, no matter what I do. I object. I reassure him. I say we'll find a way, but I can't stop my sister Clara's voice from creeping into my head. Two cripples. How is that going to work out? I cry in the bathroom. I do it silently, come out cheerful. I don't know that fears kept hidden only grow more fierce. I don't know that my habits of providing and placating, of pretending, are only making us worse. Please support me with a like and a subscription. Thank you.